Welcome back to the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. I'm your host, Justin Stoddart. Very excited to bring you some information that's going to separate you in the year 2021. The reality is there's a lot of competitors out there. Uh, you have a lot of people to compete with and inventory is low. There are a lot of people competing for the same listings as you. So how do you set yourself apart? Today's episode is going to give you that as well as some very tactical strategies on how you can understand business succession, business planning, wealth preservation. I have with me an expert today. Before I introduce him, I want to remind you that inside of the Think Bigger Real Estate group on Facebook, we take uh, snippets of, of these shows. We put them there so that you can go deep and apply these things into your business and into your life to help you be a big thinker and high achiever. If you're not yet a member of that group, go do that now. And uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and move into um, to uh, today's episode again. Steve Goodman. Um, he's out of um, Long Island area, uh, happens to be spending some time in Florida right now. Great individual, has written a book on this topic. Um, Steve, it's a pleasure to have you on the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. Thank you for coming uh, here to pour into us today. Justin, thank you for having me as a guest. Yeah, that's my pleasure. Uh, now, you've done some 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 great things uh, when it comes to helping people. You're at the core, you're a, a, a CPA, right? Yes. But you've also become an author and do a lot of uh, kind of business strategy, helping businesses, again, really um, kind of understand how to move from one person to another, whether it be familial, right? Whether you're passing to a family, et cetera. Talk to us a little bit more, uh, um, a little bit more about what our guests would need to know about you today to where they can really kind of understand where you're coming from and your background. Well, my background's pretty broad and I, I kind of tap into a lot of different areas, but on the business succession side, what that really means is every business, every, any owner of any business, there's always a succession. The succession could be that the business closes down after something happens to them or they go out of business. But ultimately, if somebody's going to take over the business, is it another partner? Is it a key employee? Is it family? Um, every one of those has complexities and they're all different. They have similarities to it, but there's a lot of differences in each of those situations. And a lot of time I spend with business owners is on what happens if something happens to you that are proverbial. If you got hit by a bus tomorrow, you know, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to your business? What happens to your family? You know, who ends up with the business? How do they end up with the business? What are the tax issues for them to end up with the business? So a lot of that is what I get involved in. I've written a book on succession planning that really gets in deep into all of those areas. It's interesting. I was having a, a thought this morning, Steve. I've uh, got some great clients that I work with um, here in my marketplace and in other parts of the country. There's this concept that um, I'll, I'll oftentimes see when people are, aren't maybe as mature in their business understanding they, ha they bring someone into the business who really compliments them. They work really well together. They can see together them doing a lot of a, a lot more business and having a better quality of life than if they weren't together. And the original owner of the business starts making some verbal hints and or comments, sometimes even promises about, hey, we're going to partner up at some point. Uh, maybe those things are in writing. Maybe they're not. Um, and then I see all too often there's an exit. And I feel like um, an exit meaning with the non-official partner, right? And there tends to be some hard feelings uh, because the one person had kind of saw a future together with this person. And all of a sudden it went from dating to, and all of a sudden the marriage isn't working out, right? I would imagine that that some of your advice lends itself to to helping people be careful about what they say, be careful about what they promise verbally, um, get things in writing. Talk to us about some, kind of some of the other pitfalls that you see. Again, our primary audience is the real estate industry, right? So you see a lot of family involved in businesses. Sometimes this passing from business from one generation to another can create some hard feelings, some missed expectations. Talk to us about some of the pitfalls that you see and how do people avoid those? Well, you know, first off, things are very different when you make promises to a son or a daughter versus making promises to a partner versus making promises to somebody that joins your business. I mean, those, those are all different kinds of situations. Um, obviously, when you're dealing with your children, you know, that's at a very, very high standard. And obviously, you have to be very careful what promises you're making, either the child's making to the parent or the parent's making to the child as it relates to the business, because yeah. the consequences there could be not just that 
you don't stay working together. It could be that all of a sudden there's no relationship between a child and their parents and the parents and their grandchildren and things like that. You know, as I've mentioned to people many times, especially when you're dealing with succession planning, especially in the scenario where you have kids involved in the business, um, the two major reasons I find that people don't plan is because A, entrepreneurs just in their DNA is that they're type A, they're, they're always thinking, they're trying to create value to their business, they want to make more money, they want to improve their business, and they're always worried about what's their problem today. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to think about a month from now or six months from now or two years from now that if I don't do this, I could have a problem. Um, right now, I got much more important things to deal with, and thus everything always gets pushed off. You know, people in general procrastinate. They, they, you know, I find whether it's my friends in business, family, whatever it is, nobody, nobody wants to do. Everything gets pushed off till tomorrow. All right. Especially if it's not urgent. So that's one big reason people don't plan. The second big reason is, especially when it comes to family, is that many times I'll say dad, because in the 60, 70 age category, most of those businesses are still run by men, even though it's going to change a lot. Certainly your generation, it's going to be very different. It's changing. But let's just say generally it's dad who started the business and is running the business. Um, dad realizes that if he starts to explain to his children what his plan is, no matter what his plan is, one or more of the children will not like the plan. It's it's never like, oh, wow, dad, that's the greatest plan I've ever heard. Like all of us are sitting there, you know, it would almost be like, you know, in a baseball team, if they went on the Yankees and they told them we have uh, 50 million dollars to allocate to all the players on the team. Here's the 50 million that's sitting in the jaw. You guys go in the clubhouse, the 25 of you, and you guys figure out how to divvy up that 50 million amongst the 25 of you. When they figure it out, it would add up to like 500 million dollars, not 50 million, which is which is because nobody would ever agree. So it's kind of like if you try to come up with a plan for your kids, someone is going to like it. So let's say you have a son who's married to someone who's your daughter-in-law, who maybe you don't have the greatest relationship with, all right, to begin with. And now all of a sudden that son feels like he is getting the short end of the stick. And now he communicates it to his wife who didn't love you to begin with. Well, now she really doesn't like you. So how does she get back at you? She gets back at you by holding your grandchildren hostage. Like, okay, if that's your dad's feeling, then mm. he's just not going to see his grandkids, you know? So like how many grandfathers don't want to see their grandkids? Not many, okay? Some don't want to see their kids, but they certainly want to see their grandkids, okay? So the second big reason why people don't properly plan is because they're afraid to. They're afraid to show their hands and their cards to their kids because they know at least one of them isn't going to be happy and that could have consequences in their relationship with their children, the spouses of their children and potentially their grandchildren. Interesting. It's almost uh, that, that holding off for fear of having a, a, that fierce conversation, that difficult conversation that just, ah, let's, let's do that later. Right? I think all of us probably do that to some degree. I'm guilty of that of like, I know I need to have it. I just don't want to have it today. Right. I'll do it in the future. Um, yeah, I could see like, that. Like that. Like that favorite fa uh, famous scene from A Few Good Men, You Can't Handle the Truth, you know, yeah. that Jack Nicholson, <laughs> one of his all time great scenes. Yeah. It's true because a lot of times people can't handle hearing the truth. And, and because of that, you know, people take it many times the wrong way. And especially when it comes to parents, it's a problem. Now, going back to your comment with like somebody joins my business who's not related to me. You, know, you have to be very careful because, you know, first off, there's ways to incentivize somebody without necessarily giving up equity. Because yeah. once once you give somebody equity in your business, even if you're a minority owner and let's say, Justin, you're a minor, I'm a majority owner and you're a minority owner, I still have a fiduciary obligation to you as a shareholder. And mm -hmm. you do have rights as a shareholder. You may not be able to control things, but you could sue me. You could demand things. You could take me to court because you could say that, you, you know, you're not being treated properly as a shareholder. So when you start promising equity to somebody, that becomes difficult because at some point you're going to be held to that. And 
if you don't want to give up that equity, um, you're going to probably end up in a very bad situation with an individual, you know, versus if you make commitments to them that don't relate to equity, but maybe relate to some sort of profit sharing or, you know, based on how much business Justin you bring in, or if the business does a certain amount of revenue or EBITDA, you know, you're going to get a certain percentage of it. And I could really measure that, you know, you were going to do X, Y, and Z, and I could measure it. It's not like subjective. It's very measurable. Um, you know, if you make those kind of commitments to people, A, they should be in writing because the person, the junior person coming in is going to be foolish to go into a business where it's, everything's just a handshake and then they don't know whether they'll, they do all this work and help, Justin helps build Steve Goodman's business up and then Steve Goodman goes, oh, that's great. Justin made me money. You know what? I'm not really ready to give him any of these things. And then you, you get pissed off and then you leave and, you know, you, you, you gave up a year or two of your life that maybe you can't get back. And now I got to find another Justin, which if I'm going to do the same thing to the next Justin, I'm going to go through a lot of Justins, you know? So yeah. I always believe putting something in writing is, is, is the right thing, but you shouldn't be making commitments and putting something in writing until you're really committed to offer that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really have some insight, right? I mean, part of what you do is not only the business planning succession, but the wealth preservation, right? And I'm sure that from a tax standpoint, the fact that you're a CPA, lends itself to that very much that you can say, maybe that's not the best way to compensate somebody, right? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, talk to us a little bit about those ramifications that it's, again, it's not just guarding feelings, guarding equity, but it's also the, the fact of, of, of guarding your own tax situation, right? No, there's no, look, there's no question that depending how one is compensated, how they're taxed is very different. Now, you know, obviously we, we're, we're I was going to say we have a new president. We'll have a new president, I guess, in like 10 days or whatever. Um, and if you go by a lot of what Joe Biden is professing, you know, one of the things he wants to do is end up having capital gains rates, especially for affluent people, be taxed similarly to ordinary income. That end up, ends up making some of the things not as important, because if if I'm going to be taxed as a capital transaction, or I'm going to be taxed as ordinary income, but I'm going to be taxed at the same rate, it may not matter. But today it does matter because, you know, the maximum capital gain rate is 20% plus the Obama, you know, 3.8%. Uh, while for ordinary income, you know, you could be up over 40%, you know, in the 40% range um, for getting state taxes and all of that. And so there's a big difference and thus how you how things are treated is important. You know, you're paying somebody like a consulting fee where it's advantageous to me because it's deductible to me to my business, but you're picking up as ordinary income. But somehow if I was giving you something that was similar to equity where your compensation could be deemed as ownership in a business that could be deemed as capital capital gain rather than or, or a dividend rather than ordinary income, it could have a big difference in how things are treated. So yeah. you have to be very careful. So best advice, I mean, that you have for, I mean, I think some people are like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to grow a business that big that it's going to matter. Right. Um, I would, I, again, I'm a guy that encourages people to think bigger and bigger doesn't always mean like more revenue. Sometimes thinking bigger just simply means being a lot smarter of like, how do you actually preserve more of the money that you make so that you can get to the, the quality of life that you want faster, right? Um, so again, please, for those that are listening, don't confuse, Justin says, think bigger all the time. That doesn't always mean a bigger business, but it does sometimes mean, mean a bigger strategy, um, you know, a, a bigger focus on, on the life that actually makes you happy, right? Um, so at what point, Steve, do you think people, is there a certain revenue benchmark that people should be thinking about really kind of having some wealth preservation talks or is it like right away like you you go get your file your llc and the next conversation you have with this is is with a cpa to start to create kind of the proper channels and set up to where beginning with the end in mind you can actually have a business that is either sellable or at least is you know reaps the most amount of benefit to you and your loved ones and potentially your partners as possible well think about it realistically there are four components that determine what kind of wealth people accumulate. The first one is, you know, is how much income you earn. Obviously, the more income you earn, the greater the chances are that you could accumulate wealth. The second component becomes how is that income taxed? 
-hmm. So many times you don't have any choice as to how something's going to be taxed. It's not like, oh, well, I'm Steve Goodman. I, I'm just going to take what you are paying ordinary income on and I'm going to pay capital gain on it. I mean, there's a certain amount where you have no flexibility. It is what it is. There are certain things that could, by doing something one way versus another, could change your tax data. So you could set up some sort of a retirement plan in your business. And depending on what kind of plan and how much you put away in a plan, you could substantially reduce how much you pay in income taxes. All right. Mm -hmm. So so you got your income, then you got how much you pay in tax. Then you have what's left. So then the next component, which is probably the most important component, other than how much you make, is how you live your life. You know, do you save? Because the catch 22 is the more you spend, the less you save, the less you accumulate, and the more you need. So like when you retire, if somebody's used to make used to spending $100,000 a year, and the next guy's used to spending $500,000 a year, when those two people retire, one that person that's used to spending 500,000 a year is not going to change his life to spend $100,000 a year, you know, they're not going to change it that much. Mm -hmm. So the person who who spends more is going to need a lot more at retirement to have the money to be able to maintain that lifestyle. But the more you spend, the less you save and thus the less you accumulate. It's like a catch 22. Right. So, you know, that's why you find, you know, you find some people who live in a beautiful house and they drive beautiful cars and they go on really nice vacations. And you don't know this, but they don't really save anything. And then you have somebody else who has been driving the same car for 10 years and, and, lived in the same house for 25 years and isn't flashy and they make the same amount of money and that person saved millions of dollars over their life because they live a very different life mm -hmm. so so the next big component which i think is so important is how much you save and then the last component is how do you invest that money what kind of return do you get on that money obviously if you save a hundred thousand a year and i save fifty thousand a year but I'm a much more sophisticated investor than you, and I'm willing to take more risk than you. There's a chance that I may end up with more money at retirement than you did, even though you're saving more because I'm making up for it based on my sophistication in investing and maybe my willingness to take more risk. OK, so, you know, it's really a combination of all of those things. But at the end of the day, if you don't save any money because you're spending everything that you make after tax, unless you have a business or a home that you are like, just goes up in value just by osmosis. You know, like I bought a house for 600 grand and now it's worth $3 million because I happen to buy in the right neighborhood at the right time. It's not because I'm a genius, you know, I just got fortunate and now I built up wealth even though I'm not saving any money or my business is building up an equity value even though I'm not saving any money but my business is going up and I could sell it, you know, other than those things, you can't accumulate wealth if you don't save money because then you don't have nothing to invest in. Right. right. So that's why, especially as people like using a lot of your clients are in the real estate sales business, that's a very unpredictable business. Like, am I going to sell 12 houses this year, six houses this year? Am I going to sell that million dollar house or that five million dollar house? Am I going to make that three hundred thousand dollar commission or a fifty thousand dollar commission? So. What's so important when you're in that type of a business, in my opinion, is you live your lifestyle based on an amount of commissions that you think is very achievable every year. And when you have those good years and you make that extra 100 grand or 200 grand or maybe 500 grand, you take that after tax money and you invest it. You don't spend it. You don't now say, oh, now I'm going to buy a built bigger house. I'm going to go on more vacations because now you've just upped your standard of living which means when next year you go back to earning the amount of money you were making in a regular year, you're going to have to cut back on your lifestyle. Okay. A, you've saved nothing and B, you got to cut back on your lifestyle versus you've saved something and you never really changed the lifestyle so that you're just continuing to live the same life. Now, look, we all need rewards. So, I mean, if you do that for X number of years, you know, at some point in time, you're entitled to say, you know what, I've saved a lot of money. It's time for me to like buy a nicer house or do something not to get me up to the expenses of this new level of income I've gotten, but maybe somewhere in between. I've kind of earned that. You know, you shouldn't punish yourself forever, but most people, they don't wait. That first year they make that bigger commission, they're buying a bigger house with a fancier car. 
And, <laughs> and before you know it, they're in that same kind of, you know, revolving door and they never save money. I think the value in having conversations with, you know, a qualified CPA business succession planner early is that you actually start to temper some of those wants because you realize kind of the, the long-term impacts, the compound effect of those short-term decisions of like, hey, we had a good year. It looks like we're always going to have a good year, right? But when you start to really even just speak out loud what your plan is, you're forced to have some some maturity and some accountability with yourself that oftentimes I think helps walk us off the ledge from, from making moves that would otherwise ha have you go from hero to zero really quickly because now you've got a lifestyle you can't keep up with, right? Or the market has done something different that, that you didn't expect. So um, I can't say enough about um, finding good professionals in your life. And, and I wanna add in, I, I wanna go down another path here, Steve. I know I kind of uh, forewarned you that I wanted to do this. You're a CPA. One of the things that I've I've done recently, as I mentioned to you, is I've uh, launched a book called The Upstream Model, in which I outline for real estate agents that the traditional way in which they go about getting business of cold market, warm market, um, doesn't always get them what they want, right? Cold market, we all know kind of the downside of that. Warm market, even though people love to work by word of mouth and referral, it oftentimes doesn't give them the amount of business that they want or need. And so um, what I believe strongly when it comes to um, what real estate agents can and should be doing is number one, increasing their value proposition by being more than just a real estate salesperson as you identify them as, which is how most people see them as, but as really a consultant, almost a wealth advisor for people's real estate portfolio to where they're bringing a higher level of value, which part of that involves being in regular conversation as a professional with people like you, both in their own life and referring their clients to people like you so that uh, their value proposition is better. In that process, I teach a way in which to start to tap into the warm referral opportunities that come from other professionals that oftentimes I think agents do incorrectly. And you and I had a conversation about this. I wanna just kind of share kind of the tail end of that conversation that um, you had mentioned that when a real estate agent comes um, saying, hey, refer me, what's your response when they come um, thinking like, oh, Steve, he knows he's got clients. He can probably refer me. What's your knee jerk reaction when the typical real estate agent shows up in that way? Well, I think in any sales profession, whether it's real estate, insurance, investments, you know, you can go pick almost any of them. Mm -hmm. The best advice I can give somebody is before you walk in and have that meeting, take a few minutes and picture you're that person. You're not you, you're them. And let's assume you have an idea of what they do. And then say to yourself, what would that, I'm now that person. What do I want to hear from this person that walks in that would make me want to do business with them? You know, you got to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And at the end of the day, generally, like, look, CPAs are a great referral source for almost anybody because they have the closest relationship generally with the client because, you know, a lot of clients won't make any decisions without their CPA. So you have to say to yourself, you're in the real estate business and you're going to have a meeting with a CPA. What, 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 what can I bring to the CPA? Well, obviously, there's nothing better than if you think you're in a position to refer business to the person that you're looking to have refer you business. Because at the end of the day, most referral relationships don't last long term if one person is a giver and the other person is a taker. I agree. You know, it's just, it doesn't work. Yeah. So you have to say to yourself, you have to look in a mirror and say, am I in a position, do I have enough influence with people that I deal with to recommend an accountant? You may have to say, you know what, I'm working on their real estate. They're not, they're not going to view me as somebody that could possibly, you know, refer business to a CPA. So if I can't refer business to you, then I, then the other only other ways I'm going to bring value to you is I'm going to bring you information that you're going to be able to utilize to either benefit your clients or can generate revenue for you from yeah. your clients. Like I'm bringing you something that you as the CPA can then go to the clients and go, look, you know, I'm working with a real estate professional, brilliant person, cutting edge, proprietary information. And, and from some of this, I think 
you're going to end up buying more real estate. And then obviously, if that person buys more real estate, not only could the real estate person make commissions, but you as the accountant may be setting up more corporations and more LLCs and more tax returns and more tax planning. So to me, it's either you got to get in business, Mm -hmm. you got to show the other person how you could help them improve their business and and make money or that you're providing some proprietary pieces of information that is going to make that accountant look like a genius to their clients and they're going to benefit by it which in turn hopefully will benefit you yeah but i couldn't have said it better um steve it's fantastic advice again i think sometimes agents sit back and they realize like yeah i've heard that a cpa could um could help me right that they are talking with their clients they know that they're going to buy or sell uh, but they're like, who am I to be um, giving them financial advice or even bringing in a CPA? If you're in that spot, I fear for your commissions long term. If you're not the person that says, I don't have the influence to be able to say, look, do you have a good CPA? If you don't, I have somebody that I'd like you to talk to. If you if you don't have the confidence in your uh, position to have that conversation with your clients, you need to work on that because I really think that your value proposition moving forward is going to be more than just what you can do for them. It's what your team of trusted professionals can do for them. And I think having somebody like a Steve Goodman, right, in your life that can really step in and add significant value to your clients, number one, will improve your value proposition. And secondly, it's going to allow um, you to start to give business to Steve Goodman, right? And or valuable information that's going to set you apart um, from every other real estate agent that just comes in with their hand out. And now all of a sudden, Steve Goodman and you, the real estate agent, start to create a relationship, right? Um, obviously, Steve Goodman being um, kind of a, um, a placeholder for other professionals in that spot or potentially a real one, right? Um, anyway, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Again, for those that are interested in uh, learning about that, how to really up your value proposition and start to get business, warm referrals flowing into your business, you can get a copy of my book at upstreammodel.com forward slash book. I've got a, a, a below cost offering for you there. Just help me cover the cost of shipping and handling. And um, it will start to change your paradigm where I think well-paid professionals need to go in order to remain well-paid and at the center of the transaction. Um, Steve, you're you're a, um, not only a gentleman and a delight to have a conversation with, but deeply knowledgeable. Is there anything else that you want to share around uh, kind of your expertise about wealth preservation um, and or would it be better at this point just to have people reach out to you directly to say, hey, look, I've been thinking about bringing in one of my kids into my business. I want to be sure I do this right or I don't upset the other kids or spouses or whatever, right? Like the worst thing could happen is I disrupt my family relationships. Um, is there is there, is there other stuff that you would want to share on kind of that topic in wealth pres- um, and wealth preservation? Or at this point, would it be better just to have people reach out to you? Well, look, you know, obviously we could spend hours on on the podcast and I can go into so many different things. Yeah. We have a limited amount of time. So, you know, I would say per- certainly people could reach out to me. I think the best piece of advice that I could give to people, because it's some of the, one of the things that I run into as a bottleneck sometimes, is be open-minded. You know, that's like, don't, you know, obviously you don't want to be sold and you got to have your antennas up. You don't want to just everybody knocking on your door. But I don't care who your accountant is, who your lawyer is, who your financial advisors are. Always be open minded, you know, mm-hmm. especially if somebody isn't just a stranger, you know, they they've done work for a friend or they've done work for an advisor. Always, li- you know, at least listen, because you may learn something and you you don't know what you don't know. You mm-hmm. know, so that that would be my advice. Obviously, would love people to reach out to me. Um, you know, a couple of things, Justin, uh, I have a, a, a landing page called Stephen Goodman dot biz where I'm offering a free PDF copy of my book on succession planning. So anybody that would find that topic interesting can get it there. You could also go to my website, which is shgplanning.com. I've written about, I don't know, about 70 articles from succession planning to wealth preservation, estate planning, annuities, insurance, investments, you know, pension. There's just a whole bunch of good articles there that you could certainly, uh, you know, download and get copies of it as well. That's great. Great stuff, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, and your, your email address or is the best way to contact you is just go to the website. Can they, can they find you there if they've got questions for you? I, I would say, you know, best way, my email is sgoodman at shgplanning.com. And, 
certainly in, in the COVID times, best way to reach me is my cell, 516-297-7390. That's perfect. I appreciate your time, Steve. I appreciate the comments. Uh, Chris Blythe, appreciate your comment here. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Steve, uh, again, total pleasure to get to know you. Um, I feel fortunate to have you in my network now. And I thank you for pouring into the Think Bigger Real Estate audience. Um, and uh, my final request of everybody listening here today are three simple words, and they are go think bigger. Thank you so much, Steve, for helping us do that today, my friend. Appreciate it. Thank you, Justin.